Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is uh, with us uh, on uh, WebEx and to who is now or later watching this video. The Geneva Environment Network has the pleasure to welcome you today for an event in preparation of the second segment of the fifth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly, which should be convening next year at the end of February. This virtual event today is part of a series of events co-convened virtually around the world by Albania, Mali, North Macedonia, Switzerland and Uruguay with the support of the United Nations Environment Programme in preparation for discussions expected to take place at the United Nations Environment Assembly. The series aims at informing stakeholders of the key findings from uh, the UNEP assessment report that was mandated by the fourth session of the uh, UN Environment Assembly reviewing the options for strengthening the science policy interface for chemicals, waste and pollution at the international level and at presenting a draft resolution for the establishment of such a panel. For those who still don't know the Geneva Environment Network, we are a network of more than 100 uh, institutions and secretariats based in Geneva that make this region one of the global hubs for environmental governance. Administrated by the United Nations Environment Programme and supported by Switzerland, we organize various uh, networking activities, including regular multi-stakeholder roundtables and briefings on major environmental trends. Chemicals, waste and pollution are one, one of the key thematics uh, we cover due to the presence in Geneva of the United Nations Chemicals and Waste Cluster. Some of the key institutions um, based here are represented uh, on our panel today. We have hosted in the past months various events addressing the topic we are discussing. The last was less than three months ago at the September session of the Human Rights Council, where we co-hosted a side event with the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Toxics, presenting his report uh, to the Council on the Right to Science. Before we go into depth on the topic we are addressing today, let me remind you that the documents presented, the summary, as well as the video of the event will be made available on the webpage of this event. The link will be reshared in the chat. Throughout the event, you can raise your questions by using the Q&A box. The facilitator will use your questions to feed the discussion after the presentation. It is now our pleasure to turn to the representative from Uruguay, co-convener of this event, for the opening remarks. Valentina Sierra is based at the permanent mission of Uruguay to the United Nations in Geneva and very active in the international community uh, in our region particularly on the issue of chemicals and waste as vice president of various bureaus uh, of, the of the chemicals and waste bodies based in uh, our region. Dear Valentina, over to you. Thank you very much, Diana, and thank you for having us today. Uh, and good afternoon all and, and welcome to, to this event on the road of UNEA 5.2, establishing a science policy panel for chemical waste and pollution. Our meeting today uh, on the Geneva Environment Network platform is part of a series of events organized and co-convened by the governments of Albania, Mali, North Macedonia, Switzerland, and Uruguay with UNEP logistics and technical support. In 2019, the UN Environment Assembly, the world's highest, highest level uh, decision-making body on the environment, recognized that science was needed to set priorities for policy making and to monitor progress. Also, it stressed the urgent need to strengthen the science policy interface at all <coughs> levels to support and promote science-based local, national, regional, and global action on the sound management of chemicals and waste. Since then, the urgency to support the rapid establishment of a solid and overarching science policy panel at the international level has been gaining growing recognition and momentum. Amongst others, to support scientifically robust decision-making processes on chemicals and waste and to allow informed, coherent decision-making and actions at all levels to help shape effective and efficient policies and to ensure scientific evidence is accessible to all relevant stakeholders. Our objective today here as co-conveners is to offer a platform to further reflect on this key issue. Ahead on the discussions of the second segment of the fifth session on the UN Environment Assembly to be held in a few months uh, from 28th of February to 2nd March 2022 in Nairobi, Kenya. Monica McDevitt, head of the chemicals and head branch from UNEP, will present key findings from the UNEP assessment report 
of options for strengthening the science policy at the international level. Sir Bob Watson, international renowned expert on science policy bodies, will experience leading, um, would experience leading numerous international scientific assessments with IPCC, with IBES, and more, will present key features that an effective international science policy interface for chemicals and waste should entail. Later on, Carlos Martin Novella, Deputy Executive Secretary of, of the VRS Conventions and a former Deputy Secretary of IPCC, will also share lessons learned from other relevant science policy panels. We will also have the health and human rights approaches with the presentations of Rachel Kupka, Active Executive Director from GAP, and Marcos Orellana, UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. A group of countries, namely Costa Rica, Uruguay, the UK and Switzerland, will propose a draft resolution on the establishment of, of a science policy panel to support actions on chemicals, waste and pollution at UNEA 5.2. Michel Schirren, Waste and Chemical Focal Point of the Global Affairs section from the Federal Office of the Environment of Switzerland, will share with us some of its main elements. We will then have the opportunity to exchange in the questions and answers section, and we invite you to share your views and perspective on this important topic. Finally, Kay Williams, Joint Head of International Chemicals, Pesticides and Hazardous Waste Hub from the Environmental Quality Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs of the United Kingdom, will be offering some concluding remarks. We would like to extend our sincere gratitude on behalf of the co-conveners uh, to John Roberts for accepting to facilitate our discussions today. We're looking forward to having fruitful discussions and encourage all of you to take an active part in this conversation. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. John Roberts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valentina and Diana, for those uh, introductions and for setting out our programme for today. Just to remind you that there will be an opportunity for questions, so please do enter them in the question and answer box, and then we will take a range of those questions and put them to the panellists as we go through our discussion. Uh, you can find the question and answer box if you click on the three dots at the bottom right hand side of your screen. Let's uh, begin then by looking at the UNEP report that has been prepared in response to the mandate which was set out by UNEA 4. And we're very uh, pleased to have two speakers to introduce that report. We have Monica McDevitt, who is the head of the chemicals and health branch in UNEP, uh, based in Geneva. And we also have Sir Robert Watson, Bob Watson, who was a co-author of that report. Um, Bob, by background, is a physical chemist. He's worked on science policy issues for governments, both in the US for uh, the White House and in the United Kingdom. He's also worked for the World Bank. But uh, particularly relevant to our discussion is the fact that he has chaired the IPCC, the panel on Ch climate change, and also chaired the preparatory process that developed the platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services. So, uh, Monica, you have the floor to introduce the UNEP report. Great, thank you very much, John. And uh, let me just call up my, my presentation here. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I'm just very pleased to be able to present the um, report that was requested by UNEA at the fourth session for UNEP to prepare an assessment of options for strengthening the science policy interface at the international level for the sound management of chemicals and waste, as you see here uh, on your screen. So I'm going to focus my comments um, very briefly on what the report was actually uh, including and what we were requested to do. And it should act as a perhaps a reminder and a refresher for, for you to go back and, and look at what has been done and what had been requested on this journey that member states are, are taking us through in terms of establishing a stronger science policy foundation for work on chemicals and waste. 
So what did UNEA resolution 4 slash 8 on the sound management of chemicals and waste uh, request? So member states um, both stress the urgent need to strengthen the science policy interface and to prepare an assessment for strengthening that science policy interface. So you'll be able to find the, the, um, the report available on the website and perhaps Sandra can put it into the chat, uh, a direct link to it. But I think we need to stress that it came out of a very comprehensive review called the Global Chemicals Outlook, the second edition, which basically um, concluded that the global goal to minimize the adverse impacts of chemicals and waste will not be achieved by 2020. Also that we know that solutions exist, but more ambitious worldwide action by all stakeholders is urgently required. And therefore a lot of the, the, the groundwork had been laid through the Global Chemicals Outlook to um, advise and to, to basically inform the need for um, the resolution that came out uh, in UNEA 4. So the, the UNEP report uh, was a very comprehensive report in terms of looking at the options for strengthening science policy work. It reviewed a variety of the existing science policy platforms, and I'll certainly uh, let uh, Bob Watson speak to that after me. It also presents the guiding questions that would need to be addressed when defining the characteristics of such a platform. The report also brought together um, some of the impacts and outputs from a strengthened science policy interface that could be expected, and perhaps even the institutional design of a science policy interface. So three options were outlined and each of them uh, provided strengths, weaknesses and implications for budgetary consideration. So the report already provides that and you'll be able to review more details uh, when you look at the report. In terms of the impact for a strengthened science policy interface on chemicals and waste, it's really important to, to look at some of the key things that we want to make an impact on in, in moving in this direction. So one of the key reasons or impacts um, that was found could arise from a science policy interface is to facilitate policy design and decision making, not only by, by member states at say UNEA, but also through the multilateral environmental agreements that relate to chemicals and waste and those that, that also impact on chemicals and waste or are impacted by them. Uh, other UN governing bodies, because of course we work uh, across boundaries within the UN and we need to work coherently and collectively, uh, and or the conference itself, the International Conference on Chemicals Management. The impact can also be found um, and could be supported uh, with capacity building, um, raising awareness, which is critically important in terms of getting the messages across on why we need to have the sound management of chemicals and waste underpinned by science. Um, access and development of policy tools, implementation of actions related to the sound management of chemicals and waste. These are all the desired impacts that are, are articulated in the report. Also important from an impact perspective is that the, the process itself is, is an important component of reaching a decision making. So wide ranges of, of stakeholders need to be engaged, national governments, as I said before, the multilateral environmental agreements, uh, financial institutions, the private sector and civil society all need to be part of the process and, and own the solutions as well as taking part in the ultimate decision making. And finally, to, to communicate those findings to the public via various media um, uh, approaches. So there are many uh, impacts that can be expected from a strength in science policy interface. What are the kind of concrete outputs that we could expect from having a science policy interface for chemicals and waste? And a lot of this was gained from the, the report in terms of the, the kinds of successes that have been found in other science policy platforms. But primary among them all is to allow for science to provide the evidence needed for policy formulation and implementation and for the policy needs to spur gathering of relevant scientific data and new research endeavors. So keeping the, the agenda moving is important, but also looking forward and what we call horizon scanning to identify problems that would require on a global level action at the national, regional or global scale. So constantly keeping ahead of the curve. Uh, this is done through things such as scientific assessments, literature reviews, and so on, to ensure that we're always keeping abreast of the, the issues related to science uh, underpinning um, chemist, uh, chemical and waste management, and ultimately pollution. 
Uh, also to generate uh, input that inform all actors in terms of negotiations. So outputs that are relevant from a policy perspective that are policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. Uh, and also to provide critical information for sharing and for informing regulatory actions and also to increase the effectiveness of future actions. So I'd like to, to leave it at that and uh, hand over to Bob Watson, who will give you more details on some of the more specifics of science policy interface panels or instruments or mechanisms uh, that go beyond perhaps what the report identified. Uh, but I would encourage you to please relook at the, the report uh, on the options. Uh, and we're very willing and very ready uh, from UNEP's perspective to support and to answer any of the questions that you may have regarding the report or uh, UNEP's work on science policy. So with that, I'll hand over to you, Bob. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. So the key is we want an authoritative set of outputs that, as Monica said, are policy relevant, not policy prescriptive. And we need to make sure that the platform is credible, legitimate, relevant and transparent. And the key to that effectively is to have a set of procedures. These procedures actually explain how the platform would work. What's the role of the plenary? What's the role of subsidiary bodies? The role of the secretariat? How one would develop and approve the scope of an assessment? How would you prepare and conduct an assessment? How would you uh, how would you do peer review by governments, scientific community, and other experts? How would you nominate and select the authors? What are the issues around conflict of interest? How would you finance such a platform? What are the rules for accepting money uh, from government, the private sector, philanthropic organisations? What type of evidence could be used in an assessment? Journals, grey literature. In, uh, also, how would you conduct workshops? All of these issues would be discussed in approved procedures. This would give the legitimacy uh, to the platform. It's also important that it's an iterative process. That means to say every few years, every three to five years, you would have an internal and external review of the platform. What's working? What could be improved? Very important to keep challenging oneself or to continuously improve the effectiveness of the platform. Inclusiveness, absolutely crucial. Monica has already said, we need governments involved, the private sector, NGOs, international organizations, especially UN organizations, World Health Organization, UNEP and others. We need to connect to the other multilateral environment agreements on issues such as climate change, biodiversity loss, and clearly need to link to the other international assessment processes like IPCC, IPBES, GEO, and GBO. It clearly needs also to be multidisciplinary, natural science, social science, humanities, economics, technology, and also indigenous and local knowledge. We've got to recognize the diversity of different worldviews. So all of these are the types of things you would need in a platform. This basically talks about how IPCC and ITBES were established. Why were they established? In each case, and I would argue this is the same for chemicals, waste and pollution, one needs to be independent of conventions and international organizations, but reflective and responsive to international organizations. I've already said it needs to be credible, transparent, open processes, basically, and it will deliver authoritative state-of-the-art knowledge for evidence-based decision-making, as noted by Monica. For both IPCC and for IPBES, it was decided the processes should be intergovernmental, and I would argue that would be the same thing for chemicals, waste and pollution. As I've noted, independent of political bodies, conventions, subsidiary bodies and UN agencies, but responsive to individual multitude of governments and international organizations. The process needs to be demand driven. 
with the scope and the processes owned by governments and indeed in both IPCC and ITVEST, the scope is co-designed by governments, the science community and other actors. This makes sure that the scope of the assessments are responsive to the needs of the governments and other key stakeholders. It needs to be comprehensive. So, for example, on climate change or biodiversity, what's the current state of biodiversity and climate? What's the impact of changes in climate and biodiversity on human well-being? And what are the response options? What are the costs of action and inaction? And that would be exactly the same for chemicals, waste and pollution. And that is, what is the state of chemicals and waste and pollution in the world today? How do they affect the environment? How do they affect human well-being? And what are the response options for the management of chemicals, waste and pollution? And one needs to not only look at the economic implications, but obviously the social implications and the technological options, the behavioural changes that would be needed by governments, uh, by the private sector and by consumers. It clearly needs to be prepared by the best experts in the world but in their individual capacity. They'd be nominated by governments, the private sector, scientific organiser, but when chosen and selected, they must be there in their individual capacity. They are not representing a government or a private sector. It needs to be absolutely prepared by, um, as I say, the very best in the world, but it needs to be geographically balanced, gender balanced and intellectually balanced. Peer review, absolutely essential by both experts and by governments. And these very long assessments need a short, punchy, policy relevant summary. We call them a summary for policy mate. They're less technical than the main reports and they have to be approved in plenary, line by line. In fact, word by word. So you might have a multi hundred, even a thousand page document that is, in, that is then summarized in literally 15, 20, 30 pages. Uh, the next slide, and my last slide, simply says that clearly chemicals, waste and pollution are strongly connected to many of the UN SDGs. And an assessment can actually look to see what is the effect today and potentially in the future of chemicals waste on human health? What is the effect on water quantity and quality? What is the effect, especially pollution, on cities? Many cities around the world have very, very high levels of airborne pollution as well as waterborne pollution. You can also consider sustainable consumption and production of chemicals. So, ineffectively, an assessment, one could look at all of these various features, look at the very strong links to the SDGs, as well as some of the weaker links to the SDGs. And so the impact on poverty, the indirect effects on hunger, education, gender, all of these can be explored in fine detail, basically. And of course, chemicals, waste and pollution have a very direct effect on biodiversity both terrestrial, uh, freshwater and marine. And therefore, one would want to make sure that any assessment on these issues is well coordinated with ITVEST and IPCC. So I think that one can definitely strengthen the science policy in space. I know for a fact that scientists around the world would be very eager to work with governments work with the um, private sector to make sure we have really good evidence for informed decision making. Policy relevant, but not policy prescription. One would uh, address this by saying, if you want to achieve the following, these are your options. If you want to avoid the following, these are your options. So very relevant, but not prescriptive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Monica and Bob for that introduction of the UNEP report and the very clear lessons there, Bob, that you drew from your experience on climate change and on biodiversity about the importance of any panel being policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. 
and independent but responsive and reflective of the political bodies, governments and international organisations who are using the science. Well, we're now going to uh, develop our discussion by having contributions from uh, two people who have a very close interest in this. And I would ask them, please, to uh, to speak for, for, for five minutes uh, each. First, we're going to have Carlos Martin Novella, who is the Deputy Executive Secretary in the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention Secretariat, but also was previously a Deputy Secretary at IPCC, so has uh, clear experience from the science policy side, both from the uh, science policy interface and also from the policy customer. Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all participants and panelists. It is always uh, challenging to speak after Bob uh, and after Monica. They have provided a very comprehensive vision of how a uh, panel on chemicals uh, should look like and what are the key issues to consider when establishing it. So I will try to be a bit complementary to their presentations and I will try to explain to you what we have in hand now. Uh, there are a number of platforms on interfaces between policy and science under the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions. I will try to tell you why they are very important and also I will try to tell you why they are insufficient and why we need something more. So, first of all, I would like to thank the Geneva Environmental Network for organizing this timely event on oceans for further linking science and policy for chemicals and waste management ahead of the expected discussions during the UNEA 5.2 in February next year. I fully agree that solid science is the foundation for any policy setting and for identifying solutions and actions on the environmental challenges that are facing today. As rightly observed by the UNED report, many of the existing science policy platforms concerned with the sound management of chemicals and waste have been established as subsidiary bodies under the global treaty. Those science policy interfaces are in general geared at generating recommendations to inform the implementation of a convention or to contribute to a convention's effectiveness evaluation. They deliver outputs on which parties can take diet policy and legally binding decisions. In the context of the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions, there is a large variety of science policy interfaces that guide the effective implementation of the conventions, ensuring that science remains at the center of all decisions. I'm grateful to be invited to here today to share these best practices and I will just try to summarize what are these bodies. Under the Stockholm Conventions, the Persistent Occurring Pollutant Review Committee, the Bob Rock, contributes to the Convention agenda, setting a stage by identifying emerging issues to be addressed, such as new candidates' POPs for listing, and to the policy formulation stage by recommending control measures based on risk profiles and risk management evaluations. It also helps the policy implementation by providing science input to various chemicals reviews or assessment reports, which are then considered by the conference of the parties, the, con the policy making body. Similarly, the science policy inter interfaces exist under the Rotterdam Convention with the Chemical Review Committee and the Basel Convention under the Open Ended Working Group. The conventions also count many small intersectional working groups established by the Conference of the Parties to conduct specific mandates, such as the small intersectional working groups to assist with technical guidance or the various partnerships under the Basel Convention. In 2017 and 19, the parties to the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions took decisions on the science policy interface in which they expressed the importance of enhancing the interaction between scientists, policymakers and other actors in the policy process to promote exchange and hold contribution of knowledge. Therefore, under the Basel Convention, there is no shortage of uh, bodies where scientists, policymakers, and industry and NGOs, all those interested, meet and trying to provide advice on the best uh, available science information. And then what is the problem? Well, on my point of view, the, the issue is that even when these uh, groups are working really well, and uh, they are providing very useful information to the conference of the parties, 
they are doing so under the mandate they have. And the mandate coming from the conference of the parties is very limited. It is limited by the scope of the conventions themselves. We are, when talking about assessing dangerous chemicals uh, for health and environment, the pop rock focuses and exclusively works on pops, on persistent organic pollutants. So it has to be chemicals that are persistent and are organic. Otherwise, they can be as dangerous as you can imagine, but if they are not persistent and they are not organic, the pop rock and the, for instance, the, the Stockholm Convention cannot address them. Secondly, uh, the, the chemicals coming for the consideration of, his, of these bodies are, uh, are coming to the table because of a proposal coming from a member state. So it's not, uh, it's not the information that is outside there that triggers the action of the scientific body. Is a proposal from a member state that is supported by the Conference of the Parties. So normally when member states take this step to make the, the request to the convention to, to evaluate a chemical is because this country already has an information because this chemical has been around for quite a long and there is already science that shows that this uh, is something dangerous and most likely the country uh, has already taken action domestically to address this chemical. So after putting all our machinery in place and seeing how this chemical can be impact environment and health in other parts of the world, two years later, we can put that recommendation to a conference of the parties that missed every two years to take a recommendation and to decide to list the chemical. So that means that when the conference of the parties decides to take action on a chemical that has been submitted by a party, it's already about 10 years too late. So the, the trigger is an important issue and the timing. So altogether, if we are looking at the interactions between chemicals and waste and the environment and uh, the policy making, uh, we need much more science. We need broader science. We need to go beyond the scope of the conventions and we need to establish uh, instruments that are uh, benefiting from the knowledge we already have on the establishment operations of the APDC and IPBES, also to be complementary to the work of the scientific bodies already operating under the conventions, and at the same time, the giving this complementarity that gives the forecast to give the capacity to evaluate what is really happening out so there, and to be able to accelerate all the processes now in place to address chemicals and change. I'm sorry, Robert, I think I took a bit longer than five <laughs> minutes, but I tried to be a bit also comprehensive. Thank, Thank you very much to everyone. Carlos, and indeed the relation between any uh, new panel and the existing conventions is a very important issue to discuss and to uh, make sure we get right. Uh, thank you very much to, for the questions that are coming in in the chat function and the Q&A. Uh, we will come to some of those as we open up the discussion a little later on. But I'd like to move on to our second discussant, who is Rachel Kupka, who is the Acting Executive Director of the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution, which is an international, are you an NGO? Would you describe yourself as an NGO, but an alliance of um, other NGOs, international organisations, anyone who is interested in tackling the link between health and pollution? Rachel, you have the floor. Excellent. Thank you so much. So thank you, John, and thank you to the Geneva, and, uh, Geneva Environment Network. It's a pleasure to be here today talking about the impacts of pollution and why we need a science policy panel on chemicals of waste and pollution from the health perspective. Uh, just by uh, way of quick background, which John sort of just went over, GAP is an internationally focused network working to strengthen the global response to pollution and health issues. Through the work that GAP and its many partners have done, it's become increasingly clear that pollution is a major underrecognized global issue. Uh, and just to be also clear, when we talk about pollution, we're talking about toxicants, chemicals and waste that humans are putting out into the environment that come back to hurt us directly through our health or indirectly through our environment through obviously contamination of the air, food and water that we need to survive. Pollution is well known to adversely impact human health, biodiversity, climate, and ecosystem health. 
And because of that, pollution is now recognized by the UN Environment Program as one of its three strategic pillars alongside climate change and biodiversity. Yet pollution is lagging in international attention and resources, and this is something that the Science Policy Panel will help address. When we think about pollution from the health perspective, the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health identified pollution as the largest environmental cause of premature death on the planet, responsible for about 9 million deaths each year. Air pollution, as we know, is responsible for about 4 to 5 million deaths, and 2 million of that 9 million is attributable to chemical exposures alone. We will be publishing an update to the Lancet Commission in early 2022, and unfortunately, it's not looking any better. When we look at the trends in pollution over time, we see that pollution is actually getting worse, and so therefore are the impacts on health and the planet. The blue line here is modern pollution, uh, uh, pollution that is caused by industrialization and urbanization, uh, ambient air pollution, chemicals and waste. And the orange line is traditional pollution or the, the water and sanitation and household uh, air pollution agenda. So when we look over time, we see that modern pollution is getting worse while conversely traditional pollution is seeing pretty good in, uh, improvements. And that's largely a result of the huge investments that have reduced emissions and exposures over time. So let's break down that chemical burden of disease a bit further. When we look at the chemical burden of disease specifically, the current bur burden of disease only includes lead and occupational health. So all of the other chemicals that we know and worry about, such as mercury, arsenic, asbestos, endocrine disruptors, PFAS, those are not included in the burden of disease. So there's a lot that we don't know. It also doesn't reflect other types of impacts on disability, such as um, the recent data released by the Toxic Truth Report from UNICEF and Pure Earth last year, which found that one in three children or 800 million kids are, are poisoned by lead globally. So clearly the existing chemicals burden of disease is an undercount, but it's a significant portion of the puzzle. And an in, uh, intergovernmental panel for, uh, for chemicals, waste, and pollution can help bring resources to sort those questions out and encourage researchers to answer those exact questions. We also know that chemicals, waste, and pollution disproportionately affect low and middle income countries. And those are the exact countries that are really and truly the least equipped to prevent and mitigate pollution and its impacts. When it comes to the international agenda, the worst impacted countries are actually not the ones setting the agenda. This is an, a critical issue that the science policy panel can help address. And this is something that GAP has been working very hard to draw attention to. And last but not least, since we're here talking about the need to establish a science policy panel, it will come as no surprise to you that pollution receives a fraction of the funding that goes toward other major health issues. And this needs to change if we're going to tackle chemicals, waste, and pollution at scale. This type of investment was absolutely necessary in the case for climate change and biodiversity conservation. Both the science policy panels for those uh, IPCC and IPBES have had enormous influence on the international development agenda and the ODA, the Overseas Development Aid and, and the philanthropic investments that, you know, there's finally good attention to these issues. It's insufficient. It's not enough. We're not taking enough action. But to point out that getting that attention, getting those investments took a lot of time. And this is something that uh, the panel needs to help do. So, in short, if we want the world to take pollution as seriously as it does climate change and biodiversity conservation, we truly need an equally important body, such as this panel, uh, public awareness, political will, and significant media attention to set targets in our global sites on translating scientific data into policy. For GAP, this means tackling and enabling, uh, it means enabling the worst affected countries to tackle pollution at source to reduce emissions and exposure risks. And a science policy panel is absolutely critical to bringing the much needed visibility and focused attention to the issue of chemicals, waste, and pollution. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much, Rachel, for giving that perspective and drawing uh, attention to the very serious burden that pollution is in terms of health. So thank you. And we'll come back to some of those points in our discussion. Um, our third contribution is from the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on Toxic and Human Rights, who has re recently published a report on the right to science. Uh, Morkos Arelina Orellana is an uh, environmental lawyer, I think is your background, and you've been involved as the UN Special Rapporteur for a year or so now. So we look forward to hearing your contribution and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much, uh, John, for giving me the floor and also thanks um, to the co-convener governments, uh, the UN Environment Programme and the Geneva Environment Network uh, for this uh, invitation to share with you some ideas and observations about the relevance of the right to science in the global uh, debate uh, that uh, will be taking place at the UN Environmental Assembly um, in, in a couple of, uh, of months. As John, you rightly pointed out, I had the opportunity to present a report to the Human Rights Council in September that is focused on the right to science. Now, this report, uh, gave me the opportunity to um, analyze the lack of alignment that exists between regulatory measures and scientific evidence. Uh, this lack of alignment uh, results from disinformation campaigns, attacks against scientists. Uh, uh, I also spoke about um, how effective science policy interface platforms were necessary uh, and indispensable, in fact, to overcome the lack of an alignment and, uh, and address the increasing toxification of the planet. Uh, so in that regard, in, 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 in light of the normative content of the right to science, the duty to align policy with best available evidence. The report also includes recommendations, uh, including international cooperation, uh, and the creation of uh, SPI, the Science Policy Interface Platforms, to transform knowledge into policy. Uh, it also speaks to the importance of the creation of a global platform. Of course, much more I could be said about, about the report, but I thought that in the few minutes that I have, I would focus on uh, sharing some observations on arguments that uh, have uh, arisen in the debate uh, since I presented this report uh, and uh, in, the, in the discussion on the creation of a global science, science policy panel for chemicals, wastes and pollution. A first argument that I, I, I wish to analyze and address is, uh, it goes as follows. What's missing is not the science, but the political will to act on it. It's uh, been argued that uh, uh, multilateral environmental agreements have science policy interface platforms, but it's often the conference of the parties that do not act on scientific advice. Um, we, we heard uh, from Carlos also analyzing this point. Uh, it has also been uh, argued that uh, IPCC reports have not helped us avert the global climate emergency. I think there's an answer to this, and uh, and, and it it, go, it it needs to focus on how can political will, be, how can political will be fostered, and it can. And the only way I would submit is uh, through mobilization of an informed population, and that's where the right to science and education are key, and we see a fundamental role in that uh, of IPCC reports. Uh, I, I do want to express optimism in the climate context. Uh, I think we're beginning to see a shift of paradigm toward decarbonization. The Paris Agreement was designed to ratchet ambition over time to reach its global mitigation objectives. We have even seen how IPCC special report on uh, 1.5 degrees has helped clarify those objectives. Now it's true, we're still far from the mark, but where go when governments have um, uh, been slow, civil society is now beginning to take into court. And in doing that, one of the key tools that it has has been precisely the uh, authoritative scientific assessments for uh, prepared by the IPCC. The Urgenda case in the Netherlands has been 
quite celebrated. The agenda relies on IPCC. Uh, the cases that are currently in the European Court of Human Rights the submissions, uh, they are all about uh, the science of the IPCC. Um, I have just concluded an official country visit to Italy. I, in fact, am joining you from Rome. Um, Rachel just now spoke of PFAS. Uh, in, in my um, end of mission statement, I speak about how in the region of Veneto, 300,000 people have been affected by contaminated drinking water out of PFAS. There are criminal and civil trials going on in the province in the court of Vincenza. If I were a prosecutor, if I were uh, the lawyer for the plaintiffs in the civil suit, I would very much welcome an authoritative assessment on the state of the science of, of, uh, on PFAS and there is, that it does not exist at this time. So in terms of the functions of scanning horizon and identifying emerging issues that uh, both Monica and Bob also spoke of recently. That's um, that's a point that is is very important in the in the in the, in the functions of an SPI platform. Um, so that is in regards to uh, to the political will. A, a second argument that has been presented is that the I, the IPCC is not a public relations company, so we shouldn't expect uh, any science policy interface platform to uh, focus on dissemination of information. <coughs> but I would argue that uh, if you look back a couple of months ago, when the summary for policymakers of, um, of the, the, the physical science basis of climate change in the IPC6 uh, assessment report uh, came out, the coverage of that was uh, impressive around the world. Uh, and so we can see how it's, it's true that the IPCC is not a public relations company, but its reports, its summaries, they are having an impact all around all around the globe in terms of the uh, ability of people being informed about uh, the climate emergency. Um, so, so uh, I would move to because of time to a third argument is that. A global SPI platform, it has been argued, would divert resources from implementation. Yeah. Instead of uh, spending the money on setting up a new uh, intergovernmental platform, we should spend the money on actual projects uh, to uh, address the impacts that uh, chemicals, wastes and pollution are having on people. Now, if we look at uh, the current allocation of uh, global environmental facility for the Stockholm Convention, we see 392 million. Now, this is this is clearly inadequate in account, on account of the needs that have been estimated at 4.4 billion. And uh, for other MEAs, these needs uh, have not been even quantified. But the couple millions of dollars that would cost to put to set up this uh, platform. In my, in my view, in the broader context would clearly pay off. Uh, the costs of inaction have been described. Um, Rachel spoke about the impact on ODA flows. Uh, and so that, that evidence is, is compelling. The last point, uh, and again, for the time that I'd like to make is that it has been argued that a new platform has the risk of the potential for corporate capture and conflicts of interest. Now, I, I see in this argument much merit and real risk uh, now, but this is a question of design, as, as Bob pointed out, uh, and the need to avoid conflict of interests. My report to the Council is detailed on this and, and the need to not just manage conflict of interest through disclosures, but to avoid them altogether to preserve the integrity of the uh, science policy interface uh, platform. Uh, so, in conclusion, I will uh, simply point out that the, a global science policy platform would deliver important benefits for the realization of the right to science, which would enable the international community to have a new tool to fight uh, the toxification of the planet. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcos, for that contribution and raising a number of important points, which I'm sure we'll come back to in our discussion. So thank you for that. And thank you for the various comments that are being made in the chat and the Q&A. Just to say that there is a web link to Marco's uh, report, the one he referred to, in the chat function. Uh, earlier on, Valentina mentioned that a group of countries had indicated that they would be putting forward a resolution 
for UNEA 5 to consider when it resumes in February, March next year. And indeed, the, the text of the resolution was published on Friday. I'm now very pleased to welcome Michelle Tiren from the Swiss Ministry of the Environment, who's going to uh, tell us what that resolution contains. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, John, for giving me the floor. Very happy to be here and speak in this webinar on behalf of the group of co-sponsors for this draft decision um, for UNEA 5. This group of co-sponsors uh, currently are uh, Costa Rica, Ghana, Mali, Norway, Switzerland, the UK and Uruguay. I will now um, take a few minutes to inform you about um, the elements of that draft decision. And um, I'm so looking forward to the, the discussion that we will have afterwards. So where are we coming from? Um, why are we um, proposing as a group of co-sponsors this uh, decision for UNEA 5? We've heard um, from previous speakers, in particular Monica from UNEP, uh, speaking about the, um, the Global Chemicals Outlook. And uh, in fact, this was an element of the context for us that the GCO2 clearly stated the, that there are many gaps uh, in terms of the in knowledge and information um, regarding the effects on uh, human health and the environment of many chemicals. And also that um, this information where it is available, uh, it is not always uh, accessible. And also where information is available, action is uh, insufficient. And that this situation uh, is problematic and uh, clearly uh, the GCO2 states that business as usual is not an option. So there needs to be um, more science and more science-based uh, action if we want to achieve the SDGs and in particular SDG 12.4 uh, which is the sound management of chemicals and waste. And other important element was the UNEA 4 um, resolution that um, underlined and recognized the key role of science and science-based decision making. And um, this um, resolution was uh, adopted and was possible because of the very strong leadership of the African group on, uh, on the matter. And um, Switzerland also co-sponsored that resolution. And a lot of the work that has happened since by UNEP and many stakeholders actually um, also uh, attending this um, webinar today is, um, you know, reference that UNEA decision and, um, and, and our sort of a follow-up <coughs> work to, to that. Then another important element uh, for our group was to recognize the new midterm strategy of UNEP. Uh, Rachel also uh, mentioned earlier this element that now um, chemicals and uh, pollution action is uh, the third sub program uh, in, in this UNEP strategy, which, which we also very much welcome. And um, of course, we all know that um, uh, for, the, for the climate uh, change uh, cluster, the, um, the robust scientific uh, reference is the IPCC. And um, that also the biodiversity cluster has that um, same expertise and capacity uh, in, in, in the institution of IPBES. And um, so we clearly um, recognize that this is missing for the chemicals and pollution um, cluster and, and therefore also for that um, midterm strategy of UNEP. And this is clearly um, shown to us. So what do we propose for UNEA 5.2? We propose to uh, fill that gap that I have just described. Um, so the resolution um, proposes to establish a science policy panel 
to support action on chemicals, waste, and pollution. And the panel should be um, intergovernmental and autonomous. Um, but it should, of course, be linked um, to many um, <laughs> international um, organizations and um, processes, such so, as uh, the conventions and international organizations, such as the OMC organizations, and, um, and also the Beyond 2020 instrument. Now, in terms of the functions, the resolution proposes that there should be three main functions for that panel. Firstly, there should be horizon scanning um, so that um, chemicals and waste and pollution issues can be identified and, and at an early stage and that there can be uh, analysis and discussion on those um, issues. The second fun function would be uh, assessments. So um, issues put to the panel would be assessed and this can be uh, specific uh, issues or uh, typically also very horizontal issues uh, which need to be looked at from different angles and not just from um, one point of view. Um, so not just environment, but, but also health and other um, important angles should be considered and the necessary expertise for that to happen um, should be represented in the part of the uh, scientists. And the third function would be um, you know, to, to provide and to share that information and knowledge to the different groups of stakeholders. Um, uh, as um, Marcos has just indicated, um, there is a very big impact of uh, IPCC reports and, and, um, and certainly also the IPFES reports in the media um, in, in, for many stakeholder groups. And so this creates a situation where the different stakeholder groups are very well uh, aware of the, the issues at hand and um, the options that are being discussed. And the aim would be to have uh, a similar situation by carrying out this function. So the resolution um, says that the uh, science policy panel would provide authoritative, independent, credible, policy relevant advice. So really ensuring that this is um, solid science that is put forward and what is put forward should be, you know, assessments and, and options. As um, Bob um, very well described it, it's um, uh, what is the issue with pollution? Um, what is the state? What is the, the effect on humans and the environment? What are the options? What are the implications of the options? Um, but then also stop at that because the, the decision making should remain with um, decision pol policy decision making processes. The, um, the panel should certainly support um, the MEAs and uh, international organizations. Um, but also governments and the private sector. So clearly um, this should be relevant for the different groups of, of stakeholders. And because um, actually not everything needs to be agreed or can be agreed at UNEA in February, uh, the resolution proposes that uh, some of the more detailed um, remaining open points should be clarified and negotiated in a process starting after UNEA 5.2. So this resolution proposes to establish, therefore, an open-ended working group that would um, that would take up the the open points and clarify those. And the resolution also invites the WHO to play a role regarding the organization uh, and also the content of um, the meetings. The resolution also <clears throat> indicates um, some elements that need to be taken into account. Um, we already touched upon the first one, which is uh, the panel needs to be policy relevant, but not policy pre prescriptive. So again, uh, it's to 
you know, be aware of that boundary um, of providing um, the signs and the options, um, but not describe what actually needs to be um, the next step. Then another element is that it needs to be interdisciplinary. Um, so many uh, different scientific um, disciplines need to be uh, ready and incorporated in the panel in order to be able to uh, respond to some of those uh, questions and create some of those ass assessments uh, in a holistic way. And then, of course, we need the knowledge and the science from all over, over the world. So, of, therefore, the uh, geographical um, component is a very important one. And, of course, the gender uh, aspect is uh, very important as well and needs to be considered. Then the next element um, is about the, um, the processes. Those need to be very transparent and clear uh, in order for the panel to be uh, credible and robust. Um, and that also needs to be taken into account. Then the next one is not to duplicate uh, existing work. So the idea clearly is that existing knowledge and work of existing scientific committees would be taken up and used, but not duplicated. And it's um, by no means uh, the aim to, um, to replace any of those existing uh, uh, bodies. And uh, it was interesting to, to hear from Carlos uh, those examples that he had mentioned. Um, but to complement them and to also create the linkages and, to, and uh, work with them. Then the next element is uh, links to the transparency and the, the clear uh, processes. It's about uh, managing uh, conflict, conflicts of interest. Of course, um, the, the panel um, that we want to create needs to be uh, robust and credible and have legitimacy and needs to, you know, have a certain standing um, for it to become really uh, the reference uh, for for this uh, field, such as IPCC, NITBES, for their respective fields, and therefore this to manage a conflict of in interest and to be very clear about, you know, who can uh, contribute to the work and how is the work financed and so on. That is very important. And um, I believe it. we have very good examples um, uh, from other um, bodies. And uh, of course, the idea is not to copy paste as such an IPCC uh, because every cluster also has its own specificities, but uh, in terms of procedures and so on, I think the, of course there is, is a lot of experience that we can um, draw upon uh, from IPFES and IPCC. The last point is to be flexible and cost effective. <clears throat> of course, um, um, we want to have an efficient uh, panel. Um, there will need to be um, a demand driven situation on you know, what is requested for the panel to work on. Um, and of course, um, the best situation is to exist, uh, to use existing networks and existing expertise and complement that and all of this in a way that um, this can be a very uh, you know cost effective um, body uh, with a with a lean structure if if possible so the oewg um, would have to as i said take up uh, open points that remain open after unea and uh, typically this would be um, points in the field of what is the institutional design um, how is the work program determined? Um, how can we identify um, the, the actors, uh, the experts that work on, on um, the reports? Uh, how are the reports agreed? There is the issue of the, the summary. Um, and then there's the question of uh, the financing, the budget, many of the elements that I have uh, previously mentioned. So the group of co-sponsors for that re resolution is absolutely convinced that um, today we need to establish an intergovernmental uh, science 
policy panel for chemicals, waste and pollution, that this will very much help to um, fill the current gaps in terms of knowledge and um, information and data that are um, that need to be filled in order to uh, take the, the, the measures needed so that uh, we can achieve our international goals that we are uh, currently have not achieved and are um, not for all of them on track on to, to achieve with um, the current situation. Um, that situation that the new panel should also help to identify issues at an early stage. Um, we have uh, heard from Marcos the aspect of um, cost of inaction. Um, of course, it's also when we identify issues um, late or we analyze them late that um, this creates a lot of um, a costs. And um, the idea would be that the panel also um, renders it possible to, at an early stage, consider alternatives and uh, favor uh, sustainable and green solutions in, in the field of uh, chemicals and waste. And then, of course, it would be um, that the panel should be able to work with, um, with the IPCC, IPBES, but also other existing science policy interfaces and scientific committees, um, because clearly there are many interlinkages uh, between those uh, clusters. Um, we can take just agriculture as an example, where uh, we use pesticides and um, have a lot of effects on, on uh, biodiversity. And uh, the link is there very clear. And I think many other examples would, ex would exist. And, and also it is a fact that those linkages is certainly something that we have to um, work on more uh, in, in order to be able to uh, understand the issues uh, better and to have um, a more comprehensive scientific uh, knowledge base to, uh, to then uh, you know, base the common um, international decisions uh, on and also as governments and the private sector to draw from, from more extensive uh, scientific knowledge. So where do we stand in the process? We um, have had uh, webinars like this one in all regions. Um, um, tomorrow there is the last webinar that is uh, the Nairobi-based uh, webinar. And we have circulated the draft resolution text, um, are open for comments and questions. We are open for co-sponsorship as well, of course. The, the list is uh, growing. Um, uh, John, you have mentioned that we have officially submitted the, um, the draft resolution text. Uh, it should be up on the UNEA portal to as of today or tomorrow. Um, and um, we are uh, still uh, further also um, reaching out and, and discussing informally with uh, many actors, open for comments and questions. And um, the launch of the negotiations will then happen at the uh, open-ended CPR at the 22nd of February, uh, early next year. And I, I thank you uh, very much again for this opportunity to present uh, the main elements of the resolution and uh, Please uh, feel free to reach out to the co-sponsors uh, of the resolution um, with any um, questions or comments or for regarding co-sponsorship uh, from the Swiss side, that would be uh, Felix Wertley or myself, and I'm happy to put the contact in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle, for that presentation describing your draft resolution, which is indeed available on the website of the Committee of Permanent Representatives in Nairobi. And if you would kindly put your email address in the chat function, that will provide people with the link if they want to follow up with any questions or comments. Uh, thank you to everyone who has put questions and comments in the chat and Q&A function. Uh, I'd encourage any panelists who want to reply, indeed anyone else who wishes to reply, please, please do so. But we'll now have a period of discussion where we'll pick up one or two of the uh, questions for uh, a, a, an in-depth discussion with the panelists. And if I may, I'd like to start with the uh, question that 
there might be a risk that creating a new panel would be a cause for delay rather than action. Uh, Carlos did say that one of the advantages of a panel is that it could, through its horizon scanning function, identify emerging issues far faster than many of the existing procedures, which do depend on countries making proposals after problems have been identified. But equally, is there a risk that calling for further analysis could be a cause of delay, particularly if the procedures do take some time to be comprehensive and establish a consensus based approach? Um, Bob, is that your experience in the existing panels? Do they stimulate action or do they delay action? There's no question they stimulate action. I don't believe that the IPCC, ITBES, or the Stratospheric Ozone Assessments that I've also chaired or co-chaired have ever delayed action. They, they, when you get one of these panels together, you actually it raises the political profile with governments, the private sector, the NGOs, and all relevant actors. I would not be at all worried about things slowing down. There's no reason not for the policy processes to continue under the existing conventions of Basel, Stockholm, Rotterdam, Miyamata, the, uh, uh, all of these can just continue on. So I actually would say it will focus attention that we need to act. Thanks very much, Bob. And Carlos, do you have a view? Thank you, John. I fully concur with uh, Bob on what he said, but I, I would add, uh, how can delay something that is not moving? Is uh, look at the at the pops, for example, when our uh, pop rock analyzes one candidate chemical, and for whatever reason, this chemical, uh, the long distance transportation is not long enough, then does not qualify as a pop, and then this chemical goes into the limbo. Is proof that is harmful, is proof that is persistent. So it's going to be harming for a long time. But as the transport uh, across the globe is not long enough, this is not qualified as a pop. And then no one takes care. Mm. How a panel on chemicals is going to delay anything there? They will, they will probably identify these things in advance and they will suggest some course of action that is uh, not uh, through our hands in the pop rock because, uh, as I said, it's not within our scope. So I, I cannot uh, imagine how this, uh, this panel could delay action. Thank you very much, Carlos. And while I have you there, could I just ask you the question that um, there was a question raised about the possible duplication of effort to make sure that um, the any panel would not um, conflict with or duplicate work being done in the specialist scientific subsidiary bodies of the conventions. And I think from what you're saying, you would not see that as a risk, but you would see them as being complementary. Carlos? It's a risk if it's badly designed, but I think it's such an obvious issue that uh, the demarcation of responsibilities uh, and rules of collaboration between panels is something very easy to, to establish. It's not, I don't see uh, again a risk, it's uh, something that should happen and very clearly could be established complementarities and additionalities between the both uh, multilal, mul multiple bodies that work on this science police interface. Thank you, Carlos. Would Rachel or Marcus like to comment on this question? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I, I think we can pretty much agree based on the information that we do have on, say, from the health perspective on what chemicals have a burden. Of <coughs> There's uh, definitely not a duplication of effort in any of the existing uh, panels. Um, further on the preventing action, I think, uh, as, as Bob and, and the other said, it's exactly the opposite. This will definitely spur action. And of course, it's not preventing anyone from taking action. The Global Alliance on Health and Pollution has been assisting the countries that have been requesting support to the extent that we have budget to do health and pollution action planning processes. Madagascar, for instance, is currently in a three day workshop to develop a 10 year roadmap to address pollution, uh, chemicals, and waste issues. So, this should certainly spur more attention and help convince the, the donors, uh, both ODA and philanthropy to open their pockets a bit wider. Thank you. 
Thank you, Rachel. Markov? Th yes, thank you. Thank you, John. O o I thought I'd, uh, I'd make an observation on the question of, of delay, because this is a very real issue at the national level with uh, so-called uh, paralysis uh, by analysis until there is a uh, uh, a risk uh, uh, proven beyond any reason, reasonable doubt, and uh, as, as UNEP has documented, uh, three, more than 350,000 chemicals uh, in the market. Uh, going a chemical by chemical analysis would uh, would take uh, literally forever, uh, if that is a metaphor. Uh, so, so how to overcome that? Uh, that's where a scientific assessment should not be. I, I would submit confused with scientific proof. And so a scientific assessment, even if it were to identify areas of uncertainty, that would enable precisely the change of paradigm that's needed to move to a precautionary to, uh, to uh, action based on, based on hazards. Uh, because the precautionary principle is not in disregard of science. It's in, 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 in regard to the scientific uncertainties, which can be highlighted by a, an international um, platform for, uh, that would assess uh, the science on a given, on a given issue. Um, and in that final point by issue, that includes classes of chemicals. I, I think that's an important point to, to highlight here is that um, the chemical by chemical approach needs to be overcome, and this is a way to be to to begin overcoming it as well. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Marcos. Uh, could I pick up um, a, a further question, and that was about the involvement of scientists from um, lower and middle income countries, and whether how we create uh, opportunities for them to bring uh, their knowledge and experience to international bodies, which are often uh, dominated by uh, scientists with more resources at their disposal. And perhaps there's also a related question about how we ensure that uh, local and indigenous knowledge can be captured and used in these sorts of scientific assessments. Bob, is that a, an issue you've tackled in IPVES, for example? Oh, absolutely central. Let me make one very quick question on the issue of duplication. Um, in the biodiversity, the Convention on Biodiversity, CBD, has always put out a document called the Global Biodiversity Outlook. And so what happens is the convention works really closely with it best to make sure they're not duplications, they're really complementary. So very simple processes can actually bring together big scientific assessments with internal processes of the conventions. Now, the issue you've just talked about in it best, we look at five different regions around the world and we make sure there is really good um, sci uh, scientific expertise from every one of the five regions, Africa, Eastern Asia, uh, Africa, sorry, Eastern Europe, Asia, uh, WIOG and Latin America. So we make absolutely sure that there are scientists from all parts of the world, uh, both in the Bureau, in the um, scientific body, the expert panel, and of course, in both the preparation of the assessments and in the peer review process. Absolutely critical. We not only need their knowledge, but it gives scientific legitimacy uh, to the whole process. ILK, absolutely crucial, especially in biodiversity. And so IPBES has got a whole new range of processes to make sure that we can take into account the knowledge at three levels. Knowledge holders themselves that are indigenous people that understand something at a specific location. Experts that are not indigenous people themselves, but have worked with indigenous knowledge and people all over the world. And then effectively indigenous people have also got a Western university uh, sort of education. Uh, we also in it best work with large groups, partnerships of indigenous people. So bringing indigenous knowledge where you need their consent to use their knowledge, very important, absolutely critical. So geographic balance, bringing in diverse worldviews, especially ILK, absolutely critical to the success of these types of uh, assessments. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, while I have you, Bob, can I just ask another question, which I'd also welcome input from others, uh, Michelle and, and Carlos. 
is the situation for chemicals and waste different compared with the other clusters? Because within climate, uh, IPCC is relating primarily to the Climate Change uh, Framework Convention and its bodies. With biodiversity, there is a range of uh, conventions, but there is a, an overall convention on biodiversity. With chemicals, it's rather more fractured because we have the Stockholm, Rotterdam, Basel and Minamata conventions, also the ozone conventions dealing with very specific parts of the picture. We have SICEM and ICCM and we have um, UNEA as well. Does that make it more difficult to have a panel or more essential? More essential, I would say. In biodiversity, there's not only the CBD, there's about five other biodiversity related conventions, CITE, CMS, Ramsar, uh, CCD, the uh, Convention on Desertification, basically. So I think in some respects, it's actually uh, very similar, uh, effectively, that you would actually want to reach out to make sure uh, that any new process was fully inclusive, basically, of all those. And so it's just a matter of design, matter of communication, matter of putting a, a process together uh, of uh, quite often one has effectively memorandum of understanding of how to make that work. I think I missed the first part of your question. Could you repeat the very first bit? Uh... I think you dealt with the main issue there about the, okay, fine. About the architecture and we've also dealt with the uh, the question of um, making sure that there's a full range of people uh, brought yeah. in, indigenous knowledge can be captured and so on. Although, of course, everything then has to be, you know, we have to look at this specifically in the context of chemicals and waste. Ah, the one big difference, though, there is one very big difference between uh, the climate issue uh, the biodiversity issue and chemicals. A lot of the information on chemicals and waste is actually held by the private sector. And so in the principles and procedure, one would really have to deal with how do you deal with knowledge that's held in the private sector? And the only way you could use that knowledge in an assessment, it has to be open and transparent. Uh, you can't have the private sectors, I've got this knowledge, but we can't share the evidence. And so there is one very big difference between climate and biodiversity, and that is a percentage, a high percentage of the relevant knowledge is in the hands of the private sector. That's quite different. And therefore, the procedures have to deal with that very carefully. Indeed, I mean, a, a number of uh, important regional chemical regulation frameworks are based on the hypothesis that it's industry's job to provide the evidence um, against a predetermined framework and with uh, processes for testing and assessing it. But the cost has fallen on industry, which has been a, a very um, significant cost also. Uh, Michelle, is there anything you would like to add? Yes, thanks, John. Just to comment briefly also, about this um, a multiple um, processes that are relevant. I think um, currently, in fact, we need to do that effort anyways to, you know, um, find ways to connect better the different um, conventions within one field and also to better con consider the links between the different uh, clusters also. And I, I would rather think that such a panel would would um, help in that endeavor and not um, make it more difficult. If if um, if in terms of governance there is uh, some things that need to be sorted out, um, uh, sure. Then we that's something we have to to work on. Um, and uh, certainly also questions the the open end working group can can work on. But um, I think it would be actually a big step forward. Um, if we achieve to to go beyond uh, to link the diff better link the different uh, clusters and the different conventions of those clusters and actors working uh, in those respective clusters. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michelle. We're coming towards the end of our time, but if uh, Rachel or uh, Marcos wanted to ask offer any comments on the issues we've just been discussing, I think we have time to take that briefly. Thank, thanks, John. The the, the question um, and the issue that was put uh, by Bob on the table just now in terms of the difference between the chemicals and waste cluster and uh, 
And climate change and biodiversity in regard to who holds the information is, is, is a very difficult one. And in, indeed, in, in, I think I will submit that it is will be key for uh, the design of this platform. It raises a number of issues. One, for example, what duties of disclosure does industry have regarding uh, risks associated with these with its products uh, or with wastes? Uh, we see that at the national level, often obligations in this regard are um, insufficient or ignored. Uh, so that's one issue. In, in the report that I presented to the council, I speak also of the of how the settlements that um, that deprive society from information regarding risks uh, posed by chemicals or wastes are unconscionable and should uh, this practice should cease. There's there's also the point about how uh, it is often the case that um, corporate funded studies are tools for disinformation in order to influence uh, uh, unduly the regulatory processes. So in that sense, we're seeing uh, the, the pseudoscience. And so how, how can all of this come together? And uh, that's where conflict of interests uh, do come in. But I but I do hear Bob's point in terms of that maybe there's more that needs to be done in terms of further duties of disclosure um, and other tools that uh, would go beyond the design of the of the science policy interface platform. So in that sense, we're seeing a, a bigger problem than one just concerning this. Uh, the, the creation of this platform. Thank you very much. These will be important issues for the OEWG uh, when that's established to uh, work out the precise uh, arrangements and how we can come up with something that is satisfies the criteria Bob mentioned earlier about being transparent, credible and authoritative. But we're coming to the end of our allotted time, so I'd like to thank all the panellists for their comments. Thank you for the various comments that have appeared in the chat function um, and the various links and email addresses that have been put in there. Please do take a note of those. Uh, but to offer some concluding remarks, I would like to invite Kay Williams from the United Kingdom to take the floor. Kay, the floor is yours. I think we'll go over to your colleague, Ellie Bates from the United Kingdom, who's going to uh, deliver some remarks on your behalf. Thank you to the Geneva Environmental Network for hosting the webinar, which is one of six that have been convened by a group of countries, Albania, North Macedonia, Mali, Switzerland and Uruguay, and also to UNEP for providing administrative support today and to those other webinars. I'd also like to thank today's presenters for the very clear explanation they have given about the importance of a science policy interface for chemicals, waste and pollution, and the key features which a platform must have if it's to be successful. I hope the information will be helpful in preparing for the second part of UNEA 5 when it meets early next year. The United Kingdom is very pleased to be a co-sponsor of the draft resolution, which Michelle is explained so clearly earlier. Speaking honestly, when we in the UK first began to think about this issue a couple of years ago, we were not actually convinced that we needed to create a new body to serve as a science policy interface for chemicals and waste. We already have a great deal of expertise in the conventions, in UNEP and in different countries, and it, we thought, surely we can build on that. But as we thought about it, and as we discussed it further with our colleagues in the Royal Society of Chemistry, who represent professional scientists working here in the UK um, in chemistry, we became convinced that the current patchwork is not sufficient. As Bob said, we've seen the importance and effectiveness of the panels for climate change and for biodiversity, but as again, Rachel and Michelle have said, at the moment, nothing of that sort exists for chemicals, waste and pollution. So we need an authoritative and multi-sectoral body which can bring together governments, civil society and experts to provide a considered credible scientific basis for international bodies like UNEA, SICAM or the multilateral environment agreements to tackle pollution effectively and to promote the sound management of chemicals and waste. 
We will need to design a structure which suits our specific needs, but fortunately we have good examples to start from. We're therefore looking forward to taking those first steps towards creating a new panel at the UNEA 5 meeting. Please do read the draft resolution, ask any of the co-sponsors if you have any questions or any comments, and we look forward to the discussion in Nairobi. Finally, thank you again to all those who have taken part this afternoon, and thank you to John for being such an excellent facilitator. Thank you very much, Ellie, for those remarks. Just add my thanks to all the panellists and to all those who have contributed. And I just give the final word to Diana to close our seminar on behalf of the Geneva Environment Network. Thank Diana, you thank much, you for sir. allowing us to use your platform. Thank you very much. It's not my platform, it's the platform of all the actors that are active from International Geneva. So on their behalf, thank you very much, Jan, for the, your excellent uh, moderation today and uh, bringing also uh, your perspectives on the topic we had been uh, discussing. Thank you to all the panelists, but also thank you to all the, the attendees that join us uh, today or that will be uh, 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 watching the video afterwards. So as mentioned earlier, the video, the summary, uh, of this uh, of this um, uh, session will be available on the web page of the event and also we had some comments on um, uh, some didn't uh, see all the questions that were raised you might have been lost uh, in the number of comments with the links that have been shared all those will be available on the web page uh, of uh, of the event so uh, you shouldn't uh, uh, have missed uh, anything and uh, as we are closing this event just uh, a few words to announce uh, the um, two upcoming uh, 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 events, one uh, still uh, happening uh, uh, this week, it's not uh, 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 touching on, on chemicals, uh, waste and pollution, but uh, on climate, we will be uh, joining the Geneva um, um, Cities Hub with an event discussing uh, CITES and the outcomes of the Glasgow Conference uh, on Climate Change. That's taking place on Thursday um, in the afternoon, and it's an hybrid event, if we can still uh, Let's see what the Federal Council has decided today, if we can have it agreed or in person. And then um, uh, early next week, we are back discussing plastic also in the run-up to the UN Environmental Assembly. And we will start the discussions with, um, with a session on the UN system response to marine litter and plastic pollution that we are organizing jointly with UN Environment Management Group and Grid Arendal. And it's really a, a part of uh, the Geneva Bit Plastic Pollution Dialogues that are organized uh, um, also in the run-up to the UN Environment Assembly and the resolution uh, that uh, both uh, Peru and uh, Rwanda uh, have um, uh, proposed uh, uh, um, on a response to, to, to the global plastic pollution. So with that, uh, the event is now closed and we thank you all once more. <laughs>